The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Divine Hiddenness, a lecture at Baylor University in Texas. Now, the problem of evil is an incredibly popular challenge to certain types of gods, including the one in conventional Christian uh, mindsets. It's essentially, if there's an all-powerful being who is benevolent and good, then surely he would want to get rid of evil, and he would be capable of getting rid of evil, and yet we still see evil, so that doesn't make sense. So clearly there can't be a God who is good and capable of getting rid of evil. I don't like the argument at all. It's been around 300 years before you know, Christianity was born. Uh, Epicurus famously came up with his dilemma on this. I think there are times and places to use it, and uh, that it can occasionally be effective, but I'm not a fan of it, and you won't hear me use it very often because I was raised Southern Baptist, and we, were, we, we addressed this over and over again, and one of the big ideas is you're making assumptions. You're making assumptions that you could understand what God's plan was. Why is there evil in the world? Well, man's sin. Man's sin brought evil and death into the world. And this is what God allowed. Well, why doesn't he get rid of sin? Well, he will eventually, or he will get rid of evil eventually, not sin. And, um, you know, you're like a child and God is like a parent. And the way children would complain that their parents are unfair, it's because they don't understand and they don't know as much as the parent. And you can use this to talk about the problem of evil. Maybe this is the best possible world. Maybe God has us living in what is essentially the best of all possible worlds. You don't know because you're short on information and you're stuck in this position where you're never going to have enough information. And that is enough for some people to say, yeah, that problem of evil thing doesn't really faze me. I just trust that God knows, and he's working on it, and it's all good. But where we don't see good reasons for God to do something or not do something, and it appears perhaps absurd for us to play at understanding everything. So we can complain that, oh, well, why doesn't God do this, or why doesn't God do that? And when you're dealing with something like the problem of evil, the response is, you can't possibly play it being God because you don't have enough information. And that's when you get back to, well, you just have to take it on faith and you trust that God is good and everything else. And so I don't find that the problem of evil really gets anywhere. It's not, the answers to it aren't particularly satisfying, but they are roadblocks to further investigation. And it's because we can't have that knowledge. But there's another argument that I like much better that I think is far more powerful and far more troublesome, particularly with most versions of Christianity. And that's an argument called the argument from divine hiddenness. It's also sometimes referred to as the argument from non-belief. Make sure I unmuted my mic. And essentially, the argument is, hey, I don't see a God. I don't hear a God. I have no way of confirming that there's a God. Um, I see people around me who are claiming that God speaks to them, but most of them don't claim to be hearing an audible voice. They seem to be just kind of getting impressions and giving God credit for this argument, or for the, for the uh, information. Um, I'm told that there's a God who wants a relationship with me, and yet I've sought this out, and I've tried to do it the right way, and everywhere I look in the world, there appears to be nothing that leads me to believe that there is a God. It's, there's a passage in the Psalms that talks about God being hidden, and another one in Isaiah, and I'll edit those into the video as well. But this idea was formulated a bit more strongly by saying, if there's a God who wants a personal relationship with his creations, then all of his creations who aren't willingly refusing that relationship should have it. And this became the argument from non-belief. Essentially that there are people who sincerely and honestly would like to have had this relationship and did not get it or have not achieved it yet or God has not granted it yet. And that is in conflict with this idea that God wants you to actually have a relationship. I've said before that, you know, if a Damascus Road experience is good enough for Saul, then it should be good enough for all of us. Otherwise, you've got a God who's playing favorites, picking and choosing who he's going to reveal himself to. 
the, uh, the book that I'm actually working on is called If I Were God, and it starts with ideas like this, basically saying, if I were God, why would I create anything in the first place? And if I were God, why would I create it this way? Why would I communicate with people on an individual basis? I pick out one person who's going to be my representative to the masses. Why do I need to have a burning bush to talk to Moses to give information to people? Why can't I just give information to people? This is one of the areas where the, the argument from divine hiddenness is much more powerful than the argument from evil or excessive evil. Because when you're talking about evil, you can say, well, you can't understand things on the level that God can. But when you're talking about divine hiddenness, we understand relationships. We know what it's like to care for someone. We know what it's like to be cared for. We know what it's like to interact with someone, to know someone. If we know what a relationship's like. For many, for many years, I've looked at this. I was a fundamentalist Southern Baptist Christian for more than 25 years and was gonna be a preacher. And I was convinced, as anybody else in any of my churches, that I had a personal relationship with a risen Savior. And I can't tell you what their relationship was like. I can only tell you what mine was like. But theirs seemed to be about the same. And that was, you prayed a lot. You desperately sought God's advice. And even though technically you were hearing crickets, you would come to some conclusion and give God credit for it. You'd open up the Bible and read a passage and, oh, I'm going to interpret that to mean this, and this is clearly a message from God. There's no demonstration. There's no agreement. My parents moved around every four or five years uh, because of my dad's job. And he would, every time this would happen, they would pray and study. And, you know, where is the Lord leading us? They always went where the Lord led them, and it always turned out bad. So I don't know what he was doing, uh, but it wasn't great. And I've always looked at this problem of divine hiddenness as the... I've got a girlfriend, but you don't know her because she goes to another school. <laughs> That's what people are telling me when they say they've got a personal relationship with someone that they cannot provide any evidence for. And one of my pet, biggest pet peeves, um, which actually happened during a debate that I did in Canada, uh, Krista Carlo and I were doing a team debate against two ministers. And I have tried my best to make sure that I don't portray myself as a mind reader unless I'm doing magic tricks. I don't want to pretend like I can tell who's lying. I don't want to pretend like I can get into somebody's head or somebody's heart and tell you what they're really thinking. And so when a friend of mine says, oh, this apologist over here is a liar, I have to say I can't know that. I have no reason to say that that's true. He might be, he might not be. And by the way, it's almost always a he. Uh, Long way to go there. Although, I'm actually kind of glad that so many churches are uh, pretty down on having women run them because that at least means that there's 51% of the population who might not be duped into doing this for a living. <laughs> but when I, would, uh, when I was up at that debate in Kamloops, one of the ministers made the common claim that I, know, I, I have no reason to doubt that he believes sincerely that God will reveal himself to anyone who sincerely and honestly seeks him. And that because this didn't happen to me, it's my fault. I had sin in my heart, or I had a hard heart, or I didn't really sincerely and honestly seek God. This pisses me off to no end. Because what he's really saying is, he has an understanding of what God is, and it's impossible that he is wrong. And so the only other explanation is that I must be wrong. He's setting up a win-win scenario. If you are honest and sincere, God will reveal himself to you. And if God doesn't reveal himself to you, it's not because I was wrong. It's because there's something wrong with you. And I, I went off and did a little rant in the middle of the debate because I can't tell you how hard other people saw it, but I can tell you how hard I saw it. People will come up and say, what happened to you? What, what bad experience did you have that led you away from the Lord? You know, I mean, you were active in the church. You were studying to be a minister. Nothing. Nothing bad happened at all. I was never abused. I was never molested. I didn't lose anybody that I actually, you know, cared about strongly. Uh, I didn't suffer some catastrophe. I didn't have a crisis of faith. I just spent a few years living life. And when the, my secular life crumbled... 
I came back and said, okay, God, if you want me to be a preacher, I'll be a preacher. Because everybody, including my mother, thought that that's what God wanted me to be. I didn't want to. I was terrified of public speaking, which is incredibly ironic now. <laughs> Turns out the big secret to public speaking is uh, if you only talk about what you know, and you're willing to say, I don't know, when you don't know, and you're not trying to BS anybody, uh, it's a piece of cake. <laughs> but the, this process of constantly being told, there's a God, there's a God, and being surrounded by people whose experiences affirmed this. If you're standing in a church next to 20 different believers, and you're praying and singing and praising, and you feel elation and goosebumps, and you don't know what it is, and everybody around you says, that's the Holy Spirit, well, that's what it is. Except that it's not. Because we can have those same or similar types of experiences from sex, from drugs, from secular music that shouldn't be able to induce those sorts of things. And I'm not talking about, you know, just in a hedonistic sense. I'm talking about, you know, you listen to Sarah McLaughlin, uh, Tori Amos, uh, who else? Alison Krauss. Oh my gosh, Alison Krauss will make me ball. <laughs> Listen to Phantom of the Opera soundtrack. It's, it's there. And musicians have known about how to actually do this for ages. And I'm not going to go down a, uh, a sidetrack uh, about churches are just, you know, manipulating your emotions because there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, when we tend to look at at religious organizations in a top-down sense, as if they're, they're, they exist to control the masses. That's conspiracy theory thinking that I can't support because the people at the top came from the bottom. They were me and you and other people sitting out in the pews who sincerely believe. And people would ask, well, aren't you mad? Aren't you mad that your parents and your pastors, they lied to you? No, they didn't. They told me what they honestly believed. They are as much a victim of religious indoctrination as I was. I can't fault them for trying to do the right thing. I can't fault them now by saying, you know, you've had plenty of time to investigate this and I've been willing to talk to you about it and you're unwilling to have that conversation. And so now the onus is on you, um, but it still doesn't mean they're lying. It's just what they're convinced of. But because we know what it's like to interact with people, because we know what it's like to have relationships, I don't know what the response is to this problem of divine hiddenness. Because you can't say, well, God must have some really good reason for not revealing himself. When I did the debate with Cy Ten Brugge and Kate, somebody asked him about the problem of evil. Well, why does God allow this? And Cy's answer was, for reasons which are perfectly sufficient for God. Now that's a non-answer, doesn't tell you anything, but it's not necessarily wrong. Because if there is a God, he might have some reason for permitting some amount of evil. But if there is a God who wants a relationship, remaining hidden is in direct conflict with that. Picking and choosing your, 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 your representatives as if you're an alien, you know, picking out who you're going to abduct. Uh, you know, we're always gonna go out into the middle of nowhere and pick the person in the trailer who doesn't know anybody and who everybody thinks is a little bit off and we're going to abduct him. They do that, I would presume, if you were aliens and you were doing that, it's because you don't want to be detected. And so when, when you talk about a God revealing himself to people in a similar situation, it may be that he doesn't want to be detected, which is in conflict with this idea that he wants a relationship with everybody. So why create uh, a world where you put thinking beings, give them a brain, where reasoned investigation of evidence, where critical examination of what you see in the world is consistently the best way to find an accurate model of the world, to make sure that your understanding of the world is as close to what's actually in the world as possible. You critically examine evidence, you think rationally, and you don't believe anything until there's sufficient evidence for it. And then say that the most important piece of information is one that does not fit that paradigm. The most important piece of information that there is a God who exists, who loves you and wants a relationship with you, is not subject to that same level of examination. 
they will complain that it's arrogant of me and others to judge God in this sense, as if he's inept. How, how can you say you want a relationship and yet you take no, none of the steps that a reasonable individual would take to have a relationship? Well, you're just arrogant. You're just putting yourself in God's place. Well, yeah. What choice do I have? If there is a God who created me, he stuck me down in a world and gave me a brain. A brain that works. A brain that is able to look at the world and figure things out. And it's able to look at the world and say, I can't figure this thing out. So I shouldn't believe it yet, because the time to believe something is after it's de been demonstrated. And then say, yeah, but not in this case. In this case, you should go ahead and believe. And then you get into the discussions about grace and faith. That There's a lot of people who view faith as a leap of faith, an exercise, something you do. But there's a whole other school of thought where faith is something that's given to you. God's going to pick and choose who he's going to give faith to. Now. If you go with that model of God is granting some people faith and some not, well now you get somebody who clearly is picking and choosing who he wants to have a relationship with, and yet also he's granting them something that is roughly the equivalent of credulity, something that is roughly the equivalent of gullibility, because there's nothing that you cannot believe based on faith. If you set aside reason and evidence, and critical examination, and you say, I just have to take this thing on faith, you can do that for anything. You could do it for any God. So there's no way to tell the difference between these various faith-based paradigms. It's, I was asked, uh, kind of at dinner, was there one moment, one thing that made you say, oh, now I'm an atheist? Nope. Oh, I wish there was. There were a lot of things, having read the Bible many times, going back through it and reading it again, as I was trying to figure out how to convince my roommate who was an atheist, it struck me that I was coming across passages that I had read many times before, and atheists, uh, secularists, were pointing out flaws in these passages that I'd never seen. I'm not, I'm not just talking about like the begats, because we all skip those. But the Elisha story. You curse Elisha, go up thou bald head. God, and Elisha curses them in the name of God. And then two she-bears come forth and rip up 42 children. And I'd read that three or four times, because I'd read the entire Bible and studied and everything else. And some atheists challenged it. Now, by the way, there's a lot of claims uh, and websites you can find that'll have a whole bunch of contradictions in the Bible. They're not all contradictions. They're not all without response. They're not all good arguments to make. It's one of the things that will probably keep me busy even if religion went away tomorrow, is correcting all the misinformation that's come out from our side. I hate bad arguments. I hate them more when they <laughs> represent my views. And so not everything you find online is going to necessarily be a contradiction or a problem, but there's plenty of questionable and challenging moral dilemmas and situations in the good book. And for years, my favorite thing to say to people who would talk about the Bible as if it were a good moral guide is, okay, if you really believe that, would you let me read Bible stories to your child Bible stories that I pick out. Nobody ever took me up on it. <laughs> I wouldn't, I'd read it word for word from whatever version they wanted, except maybe the good news, which softens everything down to, I don't even know what some of the stories are. But the, the passage in Elisha came up about the bears, and I got to thinking, this is kind of a weird story. <laughs> Let me see what Christian apologists have to say about this because I've never really been challenged on it. So the first thing that came up was, oh, well, this wasn't 42 children. Thank you. Yeah. See? If you, guys had, if you guys had prayed before we started, it still would have gone off right now. But it, the, first, the first thing was it wasn't 42 children. It was like a gang, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, I don't care if it was Bloods and Crips. 
basically they called a guy bald. Oh, well, you don't understand. This is a prophet of God. And saying, go up thou bald head, isn't just saying bald. It's a very obscene, threatening gesture. Okay, I'm not sure I buy that. But even if it was, he curses them in the name of God and some bears come and rip them all up. Isn't there, you know, some middle ground? <laughs> like, couldn't God put up a barrier so that they couldn't attack him? And then he could say, like, you know, smack my bald head. And then they keep failing. And then it's clear that he's a prophet of God, and now they're embarrassed. And now you've got 42 more advocates to go out. And I know, I'm not God, so maybe this was the best plan. But the Bible has the bears coming out and ripping them all to bits. And what's funny, everybody know who Ray Comfort is, the banana man? Yeah. He was preaching out on Santa Monica Pier, I think. And somebody came up to him and asked him about that story. And Ray said, the Bible doesn't say God sent those bears. And he's right. It doesn't. It says Elisha curses them in the name of God. And then two she-bears came from the woods and ripped up 42 children. Young people. Crips. <laughs> and so I looked at Ray's response of the Bible doesn't say that God sent those bears. And I'm sitting here thinking, Wow. So you think that this story was included in the Bible about people cursing and threatening a prophet of God and why that's a bad thing. And it's just a coincidence that two bears came and killed them all? That's really, I mean, that's going to be your apologetic response? That it was happenstance? Well, if it was happenstance, why, just, why put it in the Bible? It doesn't make any sense. There were a lot of things like that. But the biggest reason, apart from just applying skepticism and critical thinking to what I believed, the biggest reason that I'm an atheist is because of crickets, because of divine hiddenness. Because despite what that pastor said at the debate in Vancouver or Kamloops, I spent a long time sincerely trying to get God to answer anything. My goal was to convince atheists. My goal was to fill out my obligation under 1 Peter 3.15 to be the best representative for Christ I could be, to lead people to the Lord because that's what I, what I thought he wanted me to do. And every time I came up with a problem, I'd be like, okay, God, I'm stuck. Nothing. Okay, let me go ask my uncle who was a medical missionary in Thailand and, and the most spiritually wise person in the family. No real answers. Early on, he would say things, and I would be like, wow. Like, I said, you know, I got a roommate who's an atheist. How do I talk to him about God? And he said, well, ask him where his morals come from. And I was like, what? And he said, oh, well, without God, you can't have any objective standard for morality. And I was like, well, that's brilliant. So let me run off and, and have that conversation, except that on the drive home, I figured out what was wrong with that, which led into a whole lot of talks about morality. But I went to pastor friends. I went to family members, I went to internet forums, and what I kept finding is the arguments against were always stronger and better than the arguments for. The arguments for always had some fallacy or some premise that you had to accept first. That's why Sai and those others argue from the standpoint of presuppositionalism. You have to have a God in order to think rationally, we'll just accept that and go from there. And now you're borrowing from my worldview. But no, no, I'm not actually borrowing from your worldview. I'm, I'm just taking the part that we agree on about logic and reason and using it. You're adding something to that that you can't demonstrate. But through all of this, like I said, nothing bad ever happened to me. You know, I had enough money where I didn't have to work for a year and a half. I mean, I lost my job, which led to this, but they gave me enough money. And I was like, okay, God, I'll go, I'll go to school, get a degree, go to seminary, whatever you want. Uh, you don't have to do any of that to be a preacher. One of my preachers at, at uh, our church when I was a teenager started preaching when he was 17. Southern Baptists love that. When you get a 17-year-old powerful speaker who knows the Bible and loves the Lord, bam, that's better, way better than seminary because if you end up going to seminary, and I don't know how it is here at Baylor, um, you may get into critical examination of the Bible 
and nothing is going to create atheists much faster than a critical examination of the Bible. <laughs> so over the years I've been asked, why don't you deal with the problem of evil more? And I'll raise it. It's not completely off the table. But I much prefer the problem of divine hiddenness because that gets to people, even the people who think that they have a relationship, they start to realize all those times that I thought that God was telling me something or I thought I felt this, how do I know? How do I know I wasn't deceiving myself or being deceived by somebody else? Um, and this idea that you believe in something that you can't demonstrate, that's like the girlfriend or significant other in another country or another school, starts to hit home. And they don't get to say, well, God has a really good reason for not making it obvious. They'll try. And their favorite method for trying is free will. Somehow, free will is incredibly important to God. Somehow, he has to have this world where you're allowed to make your own decisions and he can't interfere. Which means he can't reveal himself. Because if he revealed himself, then it'd be obvious and then there'd be no need for faith. Okay, well, first of all, I don't understand why faith is important. I mean, if we're going to believe things, we should probably have good reasons. That doesn't seem like a good reason. But if he's blocked because we would no longer have free will. I don't understand how that works because God could show up right now and reveal himself to me and I would agree that he exists, but that doesn't mean I would necessarily worship him. Doesn't mean I'd necessarily be a follower. As a matter of fact, for anybody who has within their view of religion, of Christianity in particular, the concept of Satan, then there is one individual for sure who has free will because he rebelled and has absolute knowledge that God exists and is probably going to kick his ass later, which makes none, none of it makes any sense. But it definitely shows that God could reveal himself to people and they would still have free will to reject. So that rebuttal doesn't work. And you can't say, well, God has some reason that we, don't under, that we can't understand that's, that's just beyond us. Because what we're talking about is a relationship and there's nothing about a relationship that should be beyond us. And if it is beyond us, then it's God's fault. Because he made creatures that he wants to have a relationship with who are incapable, thanks, Freezer, of actually having that relationship on epistemologically sound footing. And that's why I prefer the argument from divine hiddenness to the problem of evil and a lot of other arguments. And this video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.